here uh, in the eighth and final installment of the 2022 Winter and Digi Queer. I did a spell check this time, folks, and I'm glad nobody called me in because I didn't have it with a G before. All right, uh, Gender Diverse Speaker Series. It had brought us to many different experiences. Uh, one of the relatives said, because it was you asking, that's why they came. And so I humbly, uh, those in attendance, I'm grateful that um, we've been able to have conversations in the fall season with 16 two-spirit, gender diverse, Afro-Indigenous, Black Indigenous, First Nations, Métis uh, folks, and this season able to have conversations with 15. So 31 relatives and kin who have not been previously centered in conversations. I wanted to uh, support folks who may not have been asked before. Now people in attendance have, might wanna go, well, why didn't you ask me? Well, guess what? I'm gonna have a symposium and I wanna center the, the voices that never get centered in institutions, in the academic industrial complex. Why? Because if anything about today uh, shares with us, and for those of you who were not there at the Chelsea Delta, like myself, Kitsella and Jordi were, we're here to center. I've been just in this two-spirit and digi-queer bubble all flipping day, sitting between three two-spirit elders, like legit OG elders, knowledge keepers, and I'm like floating in a bubble. Um, and that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm all about community and the people. Um, so yeah, that's the first slide, folks. <laughs> um, because I, I, I want to be ethical and transparent um, in the conversations that I, I want to share and help you folks be a part of, I want to prioritize mental health supports. Just because it's for us, by us, does not necessarily mean it's not going to move something um, or, or trigger something or uh, shift the plates. And I want people to be able to have access to supports um, after our time together um, and after what our, our vibrant and amazing relatives are going to share uh, in terms of futurities. So uh, again, I have not called these. I'm going to make sure I call the numbers that I provide next time in terms of another step of transparency. Uh, First Nations and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline and Native Youth Crisis Hotline. And for the relatives in attendance or who are the relatives of Indian residential, residential school survivors, there's a 1866 number. And for folks who don't want to talk to uh, population specific folks because indigenous folks need freaking choice. So I also wanted to provide Crisis Services Canada and the kids help phone. Uh, and because I'm, it is sponsored by Laurier University, they had no idea what they're walking into or engaging in to not be ableist uh, when they offered me tenure and chair of indigenous studies. Cause I'm like, you have a gap and I'm about to fill it with my fire keeping self and with all the relatives and ancestors that I carry with me. Um, so have to put that logo down there and I have to support <laughs> the fact that they have uh, provided this opportunity uh, in a way that is able to reach folks. Um, so because I'm an educator, formally, ugh, uh, I wanted to be able to provide an opportunity for people to see what's gonna happen in our time together. I did not put technical issues there we go. You've just experienced a live recap of what it means to have technical issues arise. Um, so the panelists are going to have an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, and they're going to share uh, prompters could be who they are, their pronouns, uh, who their people are. And as nuanced as that is, as nuanced as that may be, you bring that to the conversation. Some of your responsibilities that you want to share, whether they be to your people, to the land, to paid work, to unpaid work, because we all got something going on uh, to send to those experiences. Uh, I have some prompters for questions. Uh, I moderate uh, a little bit because it's not about me. Um, the discussion and any closing remarks. Um, so hopefully that relative will make it here. Yay. Uh, I did not do, I should have done that, but now I know what I'm doing for the symposium. <laughs> Always bigger and better and futurities, right? So as our relative comes, um, yes. So as a trans person, I like to go alphabetically by first name. 
because sometimes we don't have a choice in our last name, right? And it's nation state high tied to heteropatriarchy of who married who. So these are the names that people presented me with. Hopefully that's still okay. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Chris. Who are you? Who are your people? Some of your responsibilities. And by the time um, we get to our relative storm, they'll have arrived and able to participate. So I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you, Chris. I was really hoping to go last. Uh, <laughs> hi, folks. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, Richard. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, who am I? I am, honestly, I'm, I'm in like a transitional phase. Like I am like a youth, but like, am I a youth? Right now, I'm in, I'm in this place where I'm just like, I'm not old enough to be turning 30, but I'm turning 30. So that's interesting. But I guess we'll talk about that later. Uh, I'm, my people are uh, Acadian from New Brunswick, near Bichalar, uh, and from Haiti. I'm a first generation Haitian. Um, I'm an older sibling. I'm a younger sibling. I'm part of uh, many beautiful communities. Uh, and I have the privilege of being kin to lovely Percy here, and also some really amazing dope people in my life. Uh, I'm, I'm in a transitional period in general. I'm finishing school. I've been living in Georgiage, uh, Montreal for the last four years. Uh, I'm on my way to moving to Ottawa where I grew up sadly for a year, only a year. Uh, but I also call, you know, the dish with Lonesman territory at home. Um, so I feel, I don't know, who am I right now? I'm, I'm rediscovering who I am. Um, I've had a really traumatic uh, past four years with a lot of growth uh, and a lot of important moments and challenges, but I'm, it's actually kind of nice to be figuring out who I am again and going back to uh, my, my core self. Um, I'm, I don't know how much I will contribute to this conversation. I hate when people say that, but like, I don't know how much I'm gonna contribute to this conversation. I'm stoked to listen, uh, which is why I wanted to go last. So yeah, thanks for having me here. Oh, and uh, I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thanks. I'd like to invite Haley uh, to provide an opportunity to introduce yourself and some of the prompters again. Who are you? Who are your people? Some of your responsibilities. Or nothing. Hi there. Um, so my name is Haley Robinson. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, he. Uh, I am an adopted, reconnecting Plains Cree Filipinx being. Um, my father is from Muskeg Lake, and uh, my mom was born in the Philippines. I'm trying to figure out exactly where. Uh, it's tough, you know, being an adopted child. A lot of information is kind of just like scattered out there. So I am in the middle of just trying to collect all that information and figure out more details about my life. Um, I would also like to acknowledge, acknowledge the fact that I am also still learning and I am, I'm so honored to be here and to listen to everyone and to learn more things. Like I never thought I would be here two years ago who to think? <laughs> um, I think my responsibilities are to just let people know that I am an adopted reconnecting mixed being. Um, I don't want to try to take up too much space in the fact because I am still learning, but um, it's my job to start these conversations, you know, because sometimes people don't like to talk about that or um, they don't like to include me in some conversations. And I am here to just Hello, I'm here. I'm inserting myself into these conversations, whether you like it or not. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, having me here. <laughs> Jordi. Pinamaya. Amba washte, Jordi wechampe maza mogi abi, wa u wana ke nuba na konweta, mendego abi shiga kina i dahambi. Uh, good day, folks. My name is uh, Jordi Irons. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a two-spirit Nakoro Yate and registered member of Carry the Kettle First Nation. Um, I, 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 I love that you had mentioned the, um, 
the patriarchy of of, of taking names. Um, I was uh, my grandfather Matugas uh, is uh, Arnold Soto. He comes from the Soto and Pretty Shield family, and I actually legally changed my name to Iron Star, uh, which is Mikushi. Uh, my grandmother Verna Iron Star comes from the Iron Star and Owatch family. Um, and I did that uh, uh, shortly after my my mother's passing because that's something that my mother talked about um, a lot with me is is wanting to to follow our Nakota traditions and um, and follow that uh, that line of women in our family. Um, so, anyways, <laughs> there's that. Um, I was uh, I, I live in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in Treaty Six territory, which is uh, the ancestral lands of the uh, Ocheri Shakowin, uh, the Ojibwe, and the Nehiyawak and of course, homeland of the Métis. So um, my, my cultural upbringing um, alongside like my Nakota background, I also have like little sprinkles of like Soto and Cree teachings in there as well. So these, these lands that I called home for, for 30 years and, um, and these lines of, of the lineage of, of families that I speak of are, are um, who claim me. And um, in my role in community, I don't, I don't know how like deep I want to get here. <laughs> I'm a community readiness coordinator uh, for CAN, Community Alliances and Networks, which some of you might previously know as um, Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. Um, and um, as additionally, I'm the Two-Spirit Ambassador for Fiote Canada Pride, uh, the co-chair of All Nations Hope Network, which serves the uh, core uh, neighborhoods in Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Crash. Enteo chihuato kni Juan kamano tatlang manahua kno toka keksala ni karao mehti sex kampa motlatlang treaty six kampa motlatlang Cree Blackfoot Nakota Soto Emiti tlato kamati tlato kamati tlato kamati kampa motlatlanan then and day tlato kamati tlato kamati tlato kamati e kampa motlatlan uh, Mrs. Sagas of the New Credit, Nishinabeg, uh, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Six Nations. I'm new here. I just got here a couple days ago, so I'm not 100% sure. And every time I come to Toronto, the territory acknowledgement are uh, fraught with like communication in the audience of like, no, you didn't do this right. Oh no, you got this one. Um, and so I'm gonna do the, the biggest list that my friends gave me and then I'm gonna accept shit from them afterwards. Um, <laughs> but hey, everybody, uh, my motherland is uh, Manahuac on Nicarao territory. I'm from way down South in Central America in the middle of Turtle Island. Um, and my name is Quexala. I'm Nicarao Mestizex, which means that I'm of mixed ancestry that I was the nation that I come from. Um, I'm grateful to be living currently on Treaty 6 territory, um, uh, to have been invited back to come and work. Um, and before that, I was invited to live up in Denende on um, Yellow Knives Dene First Nation territory. And I was in the North for a couple of years. Um, very grateful to be here with everybody. Um, when I think about what my responsibilities are, I think that honoring the fact that I'm a guest is the number one thing um, and understanding like what my relationship is with my land and being from and I know you're not supposed to say this but I'm from the third world that's how I was taught to talk about my country that's how I was taught to talk about my home and when I see tourism take place on my land when I see white people on my land they're there as visitors you know it's very rare that they're going to go and make a life for themselves there because they think that it's dangerous to them they think that they're not entitled to a life there they're just entitled to uh, escape there and so when i come as a guest on other people's territories that's the number one thing is how does someone see me as a guest invited or uninvited to their territory um because they probably didn't invite me um and how do i and i'm sorry there's some sirens going on um but how do I address that and how do I recognize that everywhere that I go and how do I also know that if is how do I also know that if it's if I'm uninvited or if I'm held to a certain level of accountability or if I am just immediately distrusted that that's a 100% natural reaction and that's the same one that I have and so how do I hold space as a guest in different territories um, 
And in terms of other responsibilities that I hold, I'm currently um, the interim executive director at the Edmonton Two Spirit Society, which is a really great honor to hold. Um, I also work for the Canadian Professional Association for Transgender Health. Um, and those are just my little professional things. Uh, but personally, um, I'm a water pourer, I'm at Demascaleres, I do curanderismo, and I have practiced birth work for the last several years, supporting Two-Spirit families and supporting Two-Spirits being born into this world. Um, and that's who I'm accountable to, you know, everyone who I live because of them. Like, it's not the other way around. Like, I'm grateful to have purpose and I'm grateful to have drive and I'm grateful to exist thanks to a kinship network, thanks to beautiful people who allow me to be a guest on their territory, um, and thanks to people like Percy who have paved the way for us. Um, so, that's all, Kamati. Grateful to be here with all of you. Uh, I know I kind of messed up on the time change, and as a Two Spirit Elder, two, little little Cree Two Spirit Elder shared with me, time is a time is a colonial concept, but I still need to take responsibility and storm. And I, I see that you're in your car. Am I bad for not being more clear in my communications about the time we're going to come and gather? But I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself, name, pronouns, nation, responsibilities, uh, anything you feel um, you would like our, our those in attendance to know about you. Okay, there we go. Um, hi, uh, I'm Storm. Uh, full disclosure, I have a friend in the car with me. Uh, they've traveled with me. Um, they're not really paying attention to the to the group though. Uh, just for uh, full disclosure, just making sure everybody's comfortable with that. Um, so I, I'm Storm Lynn. Um, it's my chosen name. Uh, and fairly new legal name to me. It's still exciting when I get to introduce myself uh, by this name. Um, I am Dene Suthane and uh, Nehia and Heinz 57. I don't actually know all of the, <laughs> um, all of my background, uh, thanks to colonialism. Uh, I do know I'm Hungarian. I am. Uh, Cree French Métis, uh, Dene Suthlené, and uh, kind of a few other things that are uh, local tribes. I live in um, Caladice, uh on the south side of the uh, Great Slave Lake. Um, it's the land of the uh, the Dene, the Dene Suthlené, and uh, my family comes from Dene Nuque, First Nation. Um, which is not far from where I currently live. Um, at this moment, I am in Yellowknife, which is on the north side. Uh, it's partially Samba K and uh, Pleacho lands. And uh, yeah, uh, the people I'm responsible to, I guess, is uh, really like my, my Dene family. Um, and kin and uh, the group of kids uh, in Hay River who called themselves my baby gays and refer to me as Anti Storm. Um, they are this amazing group of the next generation of uh, queer, trans, and digital queer uh, youth that are absolutely not taking the crap that I grew up with. Um, it makes me feel really good about the struggle that myself and my friends have been through in this small, isolated town in the north. Um, so I'm always aware of how my actions and behaviors uh, as a two-spirit person um, reflect on the future that they're going to experience. Um, which is not how I thought I'd live my life, but uh, it's not a bad way to to live. Um, I don't use pronouns for myself. Um, they, them are acceptable. Uh, I asked that if you're referring to me outside of talking directly to me, that just use my name um, as much as possible. They, them is, is fine. Uh, 
otherwise, because I know it can be tricky to <laughs> storm did this, storm did that, every couple words. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's uh, pretty much the, the gist of what's going on up here. Lam lam. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on me. Um, in teaching is squeezed, uh, skeloch is squeezed. Uh, I am a person of the land. And my name is Wolf. Uh, it was gifted to me by my life giver and my life giver siblings, my additional uh, life givers, uh, as it's the femmes life givers who give names to our, our people. Uh, this was given to me as an adult because I was taken and put in the care as a 60 scoop survivor. Uh, my name legally in all documents, because I'm engaging still with the nation state, is Percy Lazard. I finally this morning was able to pick up the last document that has my name and my gender marker right before this Two-Spirit Excellence today. Um, and I also am one of those jerks who's a PhD <laughs> and I use they, them, their pronouns. Um, and I wanted to continue to offer this um, because in an era across uh, helping activism and the academic industrial complex and, and the arts is this um, rise in pretend Indians and fraudsters. So I wanted people to be able to name their subject positionality as nuanced as it is, as we're all coming back into who we are, not only as indigenous beings, and that includes black indigenous, Afro-indigenous. That's, my, my, that's what my definition includes. Um, and the ways in which indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, Inuit can stop being anti-black and excluding their black and Afro-indigenous relatives. Um, and I wanted to create this opportunity because there was a gap in our communities on the land and social services, education and research, which all are part of the continual part of colonialism of white supremacy. Um, and that I wanted to create an opportunity for people to sit at a council fire with me and, and at a circle that, uh, and a table that we co-create. Um, and I wanted to elevate the voices and the beauty of our community knowledge holders, producers, knowledge producers, defenders of our families, communities, and nations. Um, and so that's why I uh, wanted to create an opportunity for people to situate themselves and bring that to the table. Um, <clears throat> why is it not coming up? What did I do? So I want folks to, uh, to bring to the conversation uh, what does the term, just prompters, what does the term youth mean to you? How do you embody the future, the idea of the future and all the places you're situated? And I wanted to acknowledge that it's through Black femmes, Black thinkers, Black feminists, Black queer folks, Dr. Grace Dillon, who brought this into my life. And I will acknowledge those people, uh, that person, uh, when I talk about futurities, um, because the way I situate it is that uh, we are already live in a dystopia as two cutie BIPOC folks. And it's black folks who remind us that we can reimagine another future as possible. And it's the young folks who reminded me today in circle at the Delta Chelsea for the Two-Spirit Gathering that you are the leaders and the bundles carrying us forward. So I'd like it, uh, I would like if you can, uh, and I wanted to situate that, if you can, what does it mean? How does it mean to embody for the future and all the places you're situated? Uh, and I'll start with Gitzala. <laughs> um, I honestly have what, what is academically an ignorant response, but what is personally all I need. Um, I worked with Wichituan, which is an incredible project out of a Miskwesiwas Gaiga in Edmonton that put together municipal funds, provincial funds, and federal funds to center urban Indigenous people. And as a part of that, they had several council fires in different circles, and um, one of them was a youth circle. They also had like matriarchs, patriarchs, elders, kind of all over the place. It was so cool. Like El Elder Ed Lavallee was one of the people who helped put it together. It was really awesome. And Tashina Makokis, uh, who's uh, Ed's granddaughter or niece, um, is somebody who brought me onto the project. And we didn't have very much funding and we needed rides places. And we had older youth 
uh, who were like coming back to the culture and who were like engaged or like coming back to Edmonton in different ways, um, who had cars and who were like over 30. And we were like, we were just like sitting in a circle being like, so how do we solve the fact that we can't drive our youth anywhere? How do we solve the fact that we don't have any money? How do we solve the fact that all of this stuff? And the solution was extend youth to 35 and we have all the resources we need from the older youth to be able to make it happen. And so every time I think of youth, I think of the definition we made together in Wichituan, which is 15 to 35. And that that's a, it's a very large window, but that there's different sections of youth inside of that. Um, and something that I've also learned in the last couple of years is how do we hold space for people who were part of the 60s scoop? How do we hold space for people who were uh, forcefully adopted out? Like, um, to recognize their youth. How do we hold space for two spirit and trans people as they are retransitioning um, and entering life in a different way? Like, how do we hold space for what that youth is? Because a trans person, like, they might not actually go through their youth until they're 70. Like, someone who doesn't have access to resources, like, might not feel the appropriate level of hormones that they want to feel in their body until they're at that age and they've gone through all of these different stages of life and the hormones are just like you know and everyone's kind of even um and so i've really tried to kind of change my understanding of youth um and also i don't know if, i don't know if i'm allowed to tell the story but um uh, my two-spirit elder bon fabian um <clears throat> one time we were at the there's two two-spirit lodges in vancouver they have one of them it's on musqueam um and we we they had just started growing out a goatee. And I was like, oh my God, you look so good. You look so good. And they're like, oh, thank you. And then we finished this, but we did the four rounds. I was their helper, I was their fire keeper. And then we came out and at the end I was like, Bon, I just gotta tell you again, like, God, Fabian, you look so good. Like, and they're like, I know, but do I look sexy though? Like, that's what I'm going for. And here's my elder coming to me in such sweet vulnerability, asking like, but do I look sexy? That's what I'm going for. Um, and it's so innocent and so non-sexual at all. It's just like two like gals gabbing, two bros talking, you know, like it was just like, we're equals in this place and I trust you to tell me and to give me feedback. And so when I think of youth, I always think two spirits are youth all the time, you know? And so I, uh, I think of puberty a lot and how many different versions of puberty we can go through our lives and how much support we need in all of those different growth, phase, growth phases kind of how chris was saying like those transition phases like they just keep coming and keep coming um but yeah grateful for grateful for the time <sighs> Haley. <laughs> here we go um yeah honestly I, I've never really looked at youth. Well, I used to when I was younger, I looked at youth as just, you have to be in between a certain age. But now as I've grown older, I've come to realize youth are just people that, that need guidance to get onto their next step. That's essentially what I am technically still a youth as well. I am looking for guidance. I am onto my next step. I am transitioning now into a new phase of my life. I never thought I would get there. I thought I would be 25 and I'd have all my stuff figured out and I'd be ooh, in like a house and job and all this stuff. No, I'm nowhere close to that. So um, youth is just people that need guidance into their next chapter of their lives. Uh, and it can range between anywhere from like 10 to again, like 70 years old, you can still be a youth and you're just looking for people to help you out on this journey. That's, that's how I feel. Um, and for the future, I'm hoping that more people just become open about that, you know, instead of looking at it as, oh, we have to look for the children, we have to help the children. It's like, it's not just about children, it's about the adults as well. We are also youth, we are also looking for guidance and for help, and we need to open that up and people need to accept that. <laughs> Chris. Um, yeah, I feel I resonated a lot with a lot that, that you both said. I, when I thought about it initially, I think I was like, oh, youth, there, I guess, 
so youth for me was very much uh about like exactly from this age to this stage or youth you move on and then you're not a youth and somehow you figured your life out or something but like obviously that's not true i've i've found out um <laughs> it was a rude awakening but uh i totally agree with katala that like and I, yeah, I totally agree that it's, you know, these transitional periods, they, they come and go all the time. Like we're always moving. I think I'm at a place in my life right now where uh, I'm kind of in between or in some relationships, this, this is it. For you, youth to me is like a relational concept. For some people, I am a youth in some of my relationships, I am a youth and I'm also a grown up for in other relationships that I have, and I have different responsibilities in both of those in those uh, relationships and those those different kinds of relationships. And I think i've I'm kind of in this place where I'm re reframing, I guess, or just rethinking where um, like youth only being a learner is something that I'm rethinking where, for example, I have this little person, the small, little my partner's youngest sibling um is this like a sweetie little envy kid who i'm obsessed with uh and they looked to me as a grown-up and i was like i'm no one's grown up like i don't know like i don't know if you want to look to me because i don't know what's going on half the time uh like i'm literally just trying to figure it out but i also had a conversation with my auntie who is uh a little over 50 and i was like auntie donna like when do you feel like a grown-up like when do you feel like it's like you know i have a handle on things and she's like, I, you let me know because I'm still not there. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to make it through? Uh, oh, so I guess life is just, you know, figuring out how to ride the wave and move through those transitions until the next one. Um, and I think that's what it is. Like youth is just relational. You, you move through it and it shifts and it depends. Is there one definition? I don't think so. Um, I think it's a lot of discomfort, <laughs> but that's also okay. And like, as you were just saying, Katsala around like two spirits are just like used to the transitions at all times, not in that way, but that's kind of what I was thinking. I think like, luckily, maybe not all of us, but most of us kind of, we're kind of used to the discomfort. That's kind of just normal. That's that goes, it comes with the territory. So um, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at. It's a lot of discomfort, but like, it's all right. We'll, we'll figure it out and also you know i think what's cool is as it is relational there are people to relate to there are things to relate to there is a certain um not commonality but like you're not by yourself necessarily in all ways um uh, yeah i think that's where i'm at right now it's hard i don't know it's weird it's weird and uncomfortable puberty exactly <laughs> at all times Journey. Yes to all of this. Yes to all of this. Like amazing points. Um, when I think about youth, I kind of like, um, I'm a prairies gal. And so naturally I think of the medicine wheel <laughs> um, and um, the, the, the different teachings that the medicine wheel um, gifts us. And one of those teachings is the stages of life, um, you know, birth, rebirth, um, youth, adulthood, and then into your elder years. So uh, like many of these uh, lovely folks have said, I think that when I when I think of youth, I think um, also of like this period in your life where you're trying to figure out who you are, or you're trying to find your community, you're trying to find your role in community, and you're trying to find why these things are important to you. Um, so I don't think that there's a um, uh, a number limits like like the you know let's say the federal government says you're a uh, youth up until you're 30. Um, I think some people can figure out their roles and figure out who they are earlier in life and some people a little bit later in life and that's okay. Um, so yeah I, I guess that that's my thoughts on youth. I don't, I don't think that it's the age. I think it's um, like everybody else had said uh, so far it's like this kind of we're just finding guidance. And um, I, I'm very fortunate enough to like, feel like in a, in a Western context, like I kind of have my life together and I just um, like, I, I am 30 now. Um, that's our secret, everybody in this room. <laughs> um, and, um, 
But I mean, I'm still at my age. I just like anytime I hear elders speak, especially our two spirit or indigenous queer knowledge keepers, I'm just like, if anybody's seen that meme of like Adam Sandler is just sitting like this, like that's me when when elders speak. Um, so I'm still learning in that way. Um, and uh, I, when it comes to like um, future teas, sorry, I don't mean to butcher that. Um, I think about an, another teaching, a different teaching, like I'm just like passing on the teachings today. Just kidding. Um, but I think about the seven generations teachings. Um, I think that two spirit and indigenous queer, LGBTQQIA indigenous people, like we're capable of doing such amazing things. And like, really, I, I was like almost like at the brink of like tears today, um, being here in Toronto for the MMIW2S LGBTQQIA plus gathering. Um, and like to, to be in a room with, with um, two spirit and digital queer organizations and advocates and like everybody from youth to like knowledge keepers, um, like that's my medicine, like being around my people, that's my medicine. And um, it just like, I, I can't even explain like the energy, the love, everything that I feel. And, and I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be doing this work if it wasn't for the seven generations before me, um, if it wasn't for the knowledge keepers that we shared the space with. Um, and, and it's, I feel like it's my duty, it's all of our duty to pass that on and and to continue this work and to continue passing down our our knowledge, our protocols, our creation stories, and our indigenous ways of knowing and doing um, to create um, a path for the seven generations that are ahead of us or behind us, whatever the opposite of what I said earlier. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, um, I, that that's what I, that's genuinely like what I pray for when I speak to Waka Tonka is like that if I, when I'm doing this work um, that it, it's not out of ego and it's out of, it's for community. And I think that if we continue our work with that mindset that we're capable of doing like amazing things. And mm. Storm. Hey, um, yeah, kind of just uh, want to like reiterate what everybody else has been saying. Um, I definitely think that being a youth or feeling like a youth is definitely something that's fluid. Um, I know in a lot of spaces, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I turned 30 this summer, which, is, you know, puts me kind of at the end of what the typical idea of like age being a factor. Um, but, you know, kind of aging out of the idea of being a youth age-wise. Um, but in conversations with some of my elders um, within the Two-Spirit community and just within my Indigenous community and my, my world, um, there are definitely times where I am a knowledge keeper um, when it comes to, you know, things that I'm, uh, you know, educated in, uh, you know, having been somebody who's worked with kind of kids my whole career, whether it's been, you know, teaching swimming lessons or working as a substitute teacher, um, where I definitely don't feel like I'm a youth. <laughs> Um, but then there are times, especially within the two-spirit community, um, using that as an umbrella term, um, and connecting with other, like, indigenous queer, um, you know, trans, LGBTQ, the, the whole community, um, where I, I still definitely feel like a youth, um, especially with, like, the decolonization process, um, which has been difficult. Um, and I think everybody kind of relates to that um, with the amount of knowledge being lost. Definitely still, still feel like a youth. Like I still need guidance. I still really heavily rely on other people um, for guidance. And um, uh, what's the word? Um, 
but yeah, just like advice. Um, and, you know, being able to check in, uh, you know, do my actions align with who I'm trying to be within these communities um, and in the different roles. Um, and meeting other two spirit people, um, especially in my hometown, um, there are people who in the context of just our indigenous community um, or, you know, if we're applying age are my elders, um, but who have commented to me that they feel like I'm their elder when it comes to being two spirit because um, I've been on the journey of, you know, being openly who I am um, for decades <laughs> at this point. Um, whereas and this is like a new journey for them, like being able to share my knowledge with them or, you know, this is a safe place to be. This is a safe person to talk to. The here are some resources. Um, yeah. So I think everybody's kind of been hitting it on the nail on that sense of that. It's, it is a very fluid thing. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say on that. So, so this whole series, uh, I've touched on the notion of two spirits um, and the seven other um, webinars. Um, and it's been recognized and for some people who are archival, if you're a historian in the attendance and you're gonna email me and cuss me about the inaccuracies, don't. <laughs> but from what I know, it was our elder, Dr. Myra Laramie, who was in ceremony at the third annual uh, Two-Spirit Conference in 1990, August 3rd, um, in Winnipeg, who, who came out and shared, this is what Creator uh, gifted me and wanted to share with our relatives. Uh, because at that time, our relatives were dying uh, from grid and gay cancer and anti-Indigenous racism. Uh, from uh, white queers, settler queers. And so this was a response for ways for us to come uh, back to ourselves and, and react and respond to the, the things at the time. Um, and so it now has become an umbrella term, right? Of uh, to represent indigenous LGBT. Uh, so what I would like to know for you folks um, do these words mean something to you? Do you have a connection and a relationship to them that you'd like to comment on? And what are the littles in your life talking about? Because Indigiqueer has been introduced because people in the generation below me and below them were like, that doesn't have meaning to us for whatever reason, and there's nothing wrong with that because I think our language is constantly evolving and I think that's the decolonial part. So I'm gonna ask Jordi to start us off and please comment the connection and relationship and what the littles in your life are saying to help you expand. Yeah, oh, I, I can talk about this for hours. Can we extend this? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, thank you. Thank you for um, acknowledging uh, Dr. Myra Laramie. So yes, uh, the, the term two spirit to, to my knowledge as well, was um, brought to Dr. Myra Laramie in, um, in a vision. And then that, that um, term, terminology, was, um, was adopted by, in consensus at that gathering in 1990, so uh, a year before I was born. Um, the term indigiqueer uh, was coined, I believe, in 2004 uh, from Thirza Cuthand. And that actually came about um, from programming, it was the name of a program for um, a queer queer film festival in Vancouver. Um, and um, to my understanding, that term um, is is kind of again because a lot of people didn't kind of uh, um, feel connected to the term two spirit, which had this notion of like like it was very. I think uh, people thought about it in a very literal sense of like a male and a female spirit. Um, um, because there wasn't like a hard definition um, given to the world. Um, and then of course the queer aspect of it was kind of like a, 
excuse my Sue, but a, a F you to like people who felt uncomfortable with the word queer. <laughs> um, so that's very beautiful. Um, and, and for me personally, I, I use the term two spirit um, because I'm very fortunate to, to be able to be in space with people like Dr. Albert McLeod or Marjorie Bakash, uh, Edla Valley, um, Elder Blue Water, who gifted me my, my spirit name and my colors. Like so many amazing, amazing people. Um, and, and I like, I can't even express how grateful I am for that. Um, so I use the term to spirit because that is like kind of the vision and the teachings that I am passed down from listening to them, whether intentionally or intentionally, like their words are what guide me. Um, now we're gonna get into like the juicy stuff. Just kidding. Um, I think, and I wanna be careful of how I word this, but the thing with the, the terminology to spirit, um, it kind of shows how small we think as human beings, um, because I think that people really feel the need to have like this concrete definition. This is what two spirit means. And um, I hear a lot, uh, uh, and I think that people want that concrete definition. Um, and it saddens me to say, but to kind of like gatekeep this community that we've built up because you know i i hear like crazy and harmful things online like you have to be sober you know drug and alcohol free you have to know your native language you have to be ceremonial like these are actual things that people post and i'm like that that's so harmful um and it, it completely um dismisses the realities that we face as it not just not just queer people, but indigenous people, uh, intergenerational trauma. Um, many of our kin were raised in the foster care system. Um, little city Indians like me <laughs> were, were not raised on, like on reserve, um, right with our, with our, like I wasn't raised with uh, Nakoda uh, knowledge keepers. Um, and and there are so many real life barriers and a variety of reasons why our indigenous kin are, are still finding that way on their path to healing. Um, and, and we need to be able to create space for them and, um, and welcome them back to their home fires. And that's like really where the healing will take place is if we treat our kin with kindness. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's, and, and I, again, you brought up um, pretendians and that, that's a real thing. And that's a whole other conversation that like, you don't wanna get me started on. Um, but these are realities. These are the realities that we face as two spirit people, as indigenous queer people, as LGBTQ indigenous folks. Um, and, and of course, um, like, like uh, you had mentioned as well, like when I say two spirit, I do to me, that is including Métis people, black indigenous people, Inuit people, um, whether they use that terminology or not, um, in indigenous, gender, sexual, diverse folks, that is the people that I hope to serve. Um, and those, those are the people and the voices that I want to uplift and echo. Um, so that's my take on the vocabulary around that. Storm? I, I think uh, Jordi pretty much said everything that uh, I, I was thinking, to be honest, um, just in terms of like the littles around me, I guess it's, uh, you know, they, like, um, like I mentioned my baby gaze, I guess I, that's a term that they came up with um, in, in terms of, you know, calling me anti-storm and stuff. Um, but yeah, like with the, the pretendians thing and uh, all of that, like it's, that has impacted me in terms of, um, like I, I wouldn't consider myself like, you know, Jersey, like a city Indian. Um, I grew up next to the Kaladeche First Nation Reserve um, and have grown up learning traditional stuff uh, having access to some of my language, um, you know, some of my traditions and stuff, but, uh, 
definitely in terms of like the gatekeeping and stuff when it comes to the needing people needing a concrete um, definition for terms um, and using that as a way to gatekeep uh, definitely does, I, I think, cause harm to our community um, in, in terms of ignoring why people might not be sober or ignoring why people don't have access um, because like, it's like I, I call myself, you know, somebody who grew up in the bush, um, literally did grow up <laughs> in, in, in the bush, uh, away from, like, I didn't have neighbors for 15 years and, uh, you know, I still don't speak my language. I know very little about ceremony and, uh, the knowledge I have is, is very limited. Um, and connecting with my kin um i've got a lot of metis family on my my maternal side and um you know it's a conversation i have a lot with one of my cousins who is metis and is white passing and grew up with a lot of with both of his parents carrying a lot of internalized racism because of intergenerational trauma um you know not only were they denied access to their culture and um like their language um just from growing up in a colonial space uh and community but the the internal race internalized racism from their parents prevented them from being able to identify as metis um or get to know the um indigenous family members that they have and so when we are talking about culture and they are talking about wanting to reach out to, you know, say even the Edmonton Two Spirit Society. Like they feel so out of place, um, just culturally. Um, you know, not being able to feel like they can relate to other Two Spirit people, and um, and I, I, as myself, um, find a lot of discomfort in entering like indigenous or two-spirit places because of the gatekeeping that exists because I don't know my language. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I definitely think it's a conversation that needs to be ongoing and especially when it comes to decolonization because in, in a perfect world, it'd be, we'd all have access um, regardless of whether or not we grew up on reserve or off reserve. Um, you know, like our, our elders had our language and traditions literally beaten out of them. Um, so when we gatekeep and say, well, you're not, uh, you know, indigenous enough <laughs> to, to use the term two-spirit because you're not sober or because you don't have your language or because you don't have this, um, it, it feels very, um, like there's a lot of, that uh, like there's still a lot of colonialism within the decolonization process that um, there's still a huge part of our community that is using colonial violence to also somehow get rid of the colonial <laughs> violence that already exists if that makes sense um, it, it's it's like the whole blood quantum issue and um, but it does make it difficult when trying to deal with people that, you know, we'll use the term pretendians um, who are causing harm to our community by accessing resources that are meant for indigenous two-spirit, um, you know, indigenous folk under false pretenses because how do you blanket term like well you can't tell people they're not indigenous enough at the same time like you need to have some kind of baseline for these pretendians to like meet some kind some kind of standard and it's it's a definitely a tricky situation for us to be navigating but I think as long as the conversation just continues around that, um, how we can protect our community at the same time, not 
isolating people who don't feel indigenous enough for being victims of colonial systems. Haley? <laughs> Um, yeah, for me, in a sense, it's, it's, it is a way of decolonizing myself because I was adopted into a white Christian family and I was super disconnected to everything. I didn't even have any native friends growing up. Like I was just always surrounded by white folk and that's, that's all essentially that I knew. Um, and so when, uh, I kind of went through like a really rough patch in my life as a teenager. You know, you're, you're starting to figure out who you are and what you're trying to do in life. And it, it led me down a dark road of um, substance abuse and all that. And when I, when I finally came out of that, I just, I, I needed to ground myself and I need to say, I, I need to find myself. I need to find who I am. I need to stop floating around and trying to grasp at things that aren't going to help me in that. So my reconnecting started, I like two years ago, um, but I only just started to find more queer people, two-spirit people. Um, again, I was always around straight cis people my whole life. Um, <laughs> so it was a really new world, but I'm. it was really exciting because I felt like there is somewhere and some people that I finally connect to and I finally feel like I belong. And um, and even though I am still learning, yes, I'm still learning and acknowledging that I'm listening to everything that everyone is giving to me. Um, I just felt like a really strong connection with this and I couldn't, I just couldn't stop talking about it and having people to like, and asking people questions and wanting to be more involved and just getting myself away from that life of, oh, I'm, I'm only white. I was adopted uh, into a white family. I can only be white, essentially. I, I didn't feel like I was allowed to even participate in any, anything involving my backgrounds because of the fact that I was adopted. And some people even did tell me, yes, like, you're not allowed. Like, you didn't grow up on the res. You didn't grow up with your culture, with your family. They, they tried shunning me. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of just have to navigate around that and find the people who are willing to help me and open up. And I'm like, I'm ready to accept the knowledge from everyone who is willing to give me that knowledge. But yeah, it is a sense of decolonizing myself and coming back to who I was supposed to be all along. Chris. Uh, I feel a little bit sad right now. Um, I just, it, both particularly Storm and Jordy, you went in the directions that my brain was going as well. Um, I think I think it's just like, you know, when you say out loud the things that you know, so specifically in terms of like, just reproducing colonial and white supremacist logics and tactics to gatekeep and it's trash and it sucks and like we get it but it still sucks um yeah so that sucks but I think so I guess for me uh I really loved when I heard the term in did you queer for the first time I was like fuck yeah like this this is it uh because I was dealing or like kind of processing how the term two-spirit was being co-opted specifically by like like the feds are talking about two spirit people. Like, what do you know? I'm like, what? That's this how I was feeling. So I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And did you queers are like, yeah, fuck you. Like, enough. You don't. Anyways, so that was interesting. Um, but then I also kind of similarly to Jordy, like I I do actually have, and I and I think a little bit of what you were saying, Haley, as well. Like I have. There's this um, two spirit also feels right, in in the lack of definition in the. And what it is as a feeling versus and in the relationship and in the practice and being and living that's just I don't know it, it feels like un, untouchable I don't know I don't know it's complicated and so T-Spirit for me still feels right uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist within the world 
in which we live and and it's complicated and um yeah i think yeah that's kind of just where i'm at i don't know people are really annoying when it comes to i've, I've just been fighting i work for a human rights organization right now and they're lovely people but they're also like oh yeah we want to like take a decolonial approach and i we were doing this consultation and this auntie was like what are you talking about like just saying oh colonialism is not deco decolonizing you can't just say oh yeah we're acknowledging colonialism and then you can check a box and so it's just i, I think i'm just like i've been in kind of like the legal world for the last four years and so recognizing that I live in a bubble or I've been living in a bubble and then having to interact with like where the world is at and like using the same language but obviously we have very different definitions we have different understandings is interesting and I'm processing that and then also like what my responsibilities are in that but that in terms of the littles in my life um this kind of goes back to the youth conversation for me uh, and also I'm glad that you brought up the seven generations teachings, because as I was, I've also been really thinking through the seven generations teachings as, as I enter this transitional period in my life where I'm like, how do I live? Like, I want to be a good ancestor. What does that mean? How do I, how do I live that? Um, so that those have been reflections. And then also like when we frame youth as learners, but they're also leaders. Like we're sitting in this room because we're, we are, we are all learners and leaders um, and what that might mean and how we relate to youth is is interesting and things that I think about and then I think about my little queerdo who like I don't understand the the TikTok generation youth I, I don't um, I wish I did but I like I, I just don't um, so that's really interesting. I think that's when I realized that I was like, maybe I'm not a youth anymore. <laughs> um, it's just different. Uh, but I, what I think is really cool is, so I have this one person who's, you know, 14. And then I have these little wee ones that are, you know, one and two. And those are kind of the littles in my life. And how I've just been thinking through like, what is my job now as like an older youth, I guess. And I think it's just to like, like just make like just move like just get out like i'm just gonna hold whatever other garbage you know people are gonna throw at you and you know like standing on the shoulders of our of our ancestors or the ones that came before us like i feel like i'm like you know getting up and like holding i don't know it's a weird it's a weird thing but really it's about just making space and like as you're saying storm like these little ones don't have to go through what we may have gone through um, it's like ensuring that I think that that's kind of like my responsibility right now. And it's an interesting and cool and sometimes like what is happening <laughs> responsibility and position, but it's also really dope. Um, and I think through again my little my little queerdo, they're just starting to figure out like what does non binary feel like like what is what does queer feel like and that's just it's a beautiful process. Um, and they haven't even like said to spirit, they haven't even approached the concept, the idea. Um, but it's it's really nice to just make space. Like it's just beautiful to like watch that process and make space and know that, you know, you can grow a coalition around these little ones and and just love them. Because at the end of the day, I wish we could all just be kinder to each other. Um, yeah, that's like a lot of nothing, but it's kind of just where my brain is right now. Yeah. Kitsella. That was a lot of a lot, Chris. That was awesome. Uh, okay, I'm gonna tell three stories really fast. Um, right after I finished high school, I was like openly queer, trying to figure out what it is. I was a person who had a sticker on my guitar that said straight against hate as a child, because it like my my gender was always questioned like or, or no my sex was always questioned by other people and so it really made me like defensive um and so I was a uh, like just really trying to be cishet you know you know as we all do um we all go through phases um but uh right after high school I'm walking down the street with this a uh, white queer friend Zach and 
they say two spirit to me. And it's the first time I heard it. And I went to, I went to school in a real white city. And so there was like, no, there's another half like Latina, half white kid there. And they used to call us one full Latina. So it was like a real racist school. Um, so, um, and, uh, and when he, they said two spirit, like they said it. And I just like, was like, like, you know, and I was like, what is that? Like, and they're just like, oh, well, it's like some kind of like Aboriginal thing where like people identify, I don't know what it is, but anyway, it's only First Nation, for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And I was like, oh, are you sure? Like, and I just like, was like, but I'm Indigenous. Like, but I'm, I'm from far away, but I'm Indigenous too. Are you sure it's not for me? And they were like, yeah, I'm sure it's not for you. And kind of how Chris was saying, it's like a federal term now. And I just like, I was like, okay. So then I lived the rest of my life. And now actually the people who I work with, the people who hired me to work here, um, we met when we were youth. Um, and we met at a two-spirit conference that I got invited to speak at and I got invited to talk at, but as like an indigenous queer trans person, not as a two-spirit. And then Hung, hanging out with the homies, hanging out with two spirit crowds, like having all of those friends um, and still not identifying. And it wasn't until I was at um, another Ocheti Shakoin uh, at Standing Rock, uh, the biggest camp there. And I was a part of Two Spirit Nation, which was led by Candy Brings Plenty. Um, and I saw my people like, first of all, messing up, like the Mexica movement came and really messed up. Uh, but I also saw my people being accepted and celebrated and held in ceremony. And I was like, what is going on? Like, do borders not exist? Oh my God, are we actually colonized? Is that actually what it is? Um, and having conversations with folks and having that be opened up for me, like, and having Candy Brings Plenty themselves in our Kichitao tell me like, you are two spirit what are you doing with your life and just like fully call me out and just be like i don't understand why you're like because i'm just like oh you know but i'm not two spirit but thank you for letting me be here like and people just be like what and then finally just like them losing their patience with me and be like you got i never want to hear these words come out of your mouth again like and that was like it was a permission and it was a receiving and it was like a ceremony and it was also a like hey, all of those people who, who, who are white, like all of these non-Indigenous people who don't have any idea how to relate to my indigeneity because they only see it as like a, a part of the Indian act, like they only see it as like a, a legal identity. Like, I don't know how to interact with them. I don't know how to engage with them. I don't know how to be with them. They don't know how to be with me and they're never gonna see me. And so they're so much more likely to be like, oh, you got a tiny little forehead, are you Irish? Um, than to be, look at my freaking outfit, you know, and see me in regalia and be like, oh, might you be indigenous? Like, you know? Um, and so that was one of the places of gatekeeping. And another, I want to just jump in with this definition because Dr. Wesley Thomas, um, as the Southwest Two-Spirit Society, we honored him during um, the second ever grand Two-Spirit Grand Entry at the Gathering of Nations Power, which is the biggest, one of the biggest powers in the world. The other big one is in uh, Hawaii. Um, but he said, to be two spirit is to have two lives and you have one. And he really recognized that within indigenous communities, we too make assumptions. We too limit people. We too like have such a limited understanding. And it goes back to what Jordy was saying about how people saw two spirit as female and male spirits both in one. Okay, that's it. That's, that's all I can make sense of right now. So I'm just gonna walk away from that. Instead of it just being like, it's just a word, it's a filler, it's a magical space. Um, but with what Dr. Wesley Thomas talked about is, so we transition from one role of what is assumed of us because we all had sexes and we didn't have binary sexes, we had trinary sexes or we had different sexes, you know? Um, but that there is something that is assumed of us when we are in the womb and when we are born and that we break through that and that we show people, this is the role that I have in this world. This is who I am. And that we occupy, and we occupy those multiple roles and how much support is needed for a two-spirit so that a two-spirit like, so that I can go out in the streets and do whatever I need to do and be the leader I need to be. And my kids are still taken care of and my kids are still in bed and my kids are still eating. Like how much extra support is needed from that? Because the, and when I think of, of gender, like Seneca, I'm an only child with womb. That's my culturally defined gender. And I, it is not enforced of me to have children because I have no siblings to help me raise them. 
I have no siblings to teach my oldest daughter what it is to be an oldest daughter. I only know what it is to be an only child with womb. And that my desire to have children is outside of the, the gender of the, of the expectations of my contribution to my community. And so that that is an extra step where it's like, if my community wants me to be the two spirit that I am and show up for them and do the things that I do, then I also want that role of being a, a parent. Like, and so how do they have to show up for me and my kids so that they're gonna continue to be supported members of our nation and cared for members of our nation while I'm out here, out and about. Um, yeah, I really, um, I got one last one, which is about the littles. Um, and I, and I think, I think Storm will, will get this too, about how like Two-Spirit isn't really used that much in the North because there hasn't been that much connection and there hasn't been honestly that much effort made on the part of Southern Two-Spirits, like an urban Two-Spirits to get into the North, to have those conversations, to make those things happen. Because when they run into a closed door, they're not used to having to go to a thousand closed doors before you get one that will open up slightly. And they're not used to the, I think that level of sacrifice that it requires to do this work, you know, because we feel so personally shut down that once we finally get into a position of power, we're like, oh, it's gonna be easy now, right? And if we forget, no, it's just the same stuff. Um, but um, so yeah, the youth that I worked with, they didn't really identify with Indigiqueer uh, or they did identify with indigenous queer more than they identified with two spirit. Um, but for me, when I try to do two spirit education, it's really more about having conversations with people about like, how can you see yourself through the lens of two spirit? How can you see your throw through the lens of like, who are you and what do you give to your community? And how's that your gender? And what do you need from us? And that is your gender. Like, um, and I, I get mad when people are like, oh, we just need a world without gender. And I'm just like, no, those are real sacred how to survive teachings. We need them. We just need to not like let go of all the ones that have been enforced on us to survive inside of colonialism. Um, but yeah, my story is about a little cis boy, Jordan. Um, oh shoot, shouldn't have said that. But it's about a little boy who, who knows their name. Um, but they, um, they asked me, they were like, so what's trans, what's two-spirit? And just like sat me down and I was like, okay, this is the first day I haven't worn makeup and been feminine to work. This was always gonna happen, here we go. Um, and we sat down, what is two-spirit, what is trans, what are all these things? And then he asked me, um, is your boyfriend trans? And I was like, no, he's cis. What does that mean? Well, you know, he's assigned the same, all that stuff. And, and then a couple of weeks, and George is like, okay, gets up, walks away. And I was like, I don't know if this was a positive or negative interaction. I just, I feel like you just questioned me on my identity and I had to justify my humanity to like a 14 year old. Oh, it's another day at work. Um, and then two weeks later, we're driving in a van and we're going like, we're going to the bush or something. And somebody says something, someone's like, what's sis? And Jordan from the back is like, I'm sis. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm sis. And this is what it means. And I'm sis, cause your boyfriend's sis, right? And he like thought my boyfriend was so cool. So he's like, he's like, yeah, so I'm sis because it, their boyfriend's sis. And like, it's just like a cool guy thing, you know? And to bring that energy to it, of just like, like it blew my mind, you know, of just having that like positive association, having someone to look up to, having someone to admire. And I think as a two-spirit myself, like that I had so many two-spirits to just shape my being, you know, like just fully shape me in my youth. Like as I was like in high school and into university um, that that's what allowed me to like hold so much space you know, and that they've held space for me and, and to be able to, to really just like let people make their own genders and show me who they are and kind of step away from that identity and just be like, who are you? Um, and allow it to be like, as someone who identifies as two spirit, like I get a little insecure when someone identifies as indigiqueer, when someone identifies as something cooler, you know, because I'm just like, oh, am I not, am I not woke? Like, oh shit, like, what am I doing? You know? And but to be able to have that space and to be shown by youth, like that, that all of these identities, like they come out of the need of not having enough space for yourself. And so how do we like within what we have, just make it bigger and amplify it as, as much to the point that when people tell us your containers no longer contain me, they don't hold me. That we're like, yeah, no prisons, no masters. Like we're not here for this then. And we step out and let like youth be free. Um, yeah.
Thanks for hosting us, Percy. Um, last question, and I'll start with Haley. Uh, what is the celebration of joy that you'd like to leave with our listeners? <laughs> um, I guess a celebration of joy for me is is being here and from listening to everyone that was involved in this panel right now. I learned a lot, honestly, today, and I'm really excited to learn more. So I'm super honored again to be being here. And I am so glad to be in a community that you guys are so willing to share with me and help me grow and help me learn more about you know, my own community. And just thank you for making me feel really welcome here. Storm. Yeah, uh, kind of the, the same thing. I am really excited. Like uh, I don't get many opportunities to, to connect with other um, like indigenous queer two-spirit indigenous folks um you know kicks all could hit it on the head with talking about the nwt it's um it is fairly isolated up here and so connecting with other people is difficult um i didn't have a community until i was an adult i was the only out out, out kid uh, in my school and community. Um, but this panel has kind of reminded me that as an adult, um, I have connected with um, older two spirits in my community and, you know, very thankful for the elder queers in my community who um, you know, went to the high school that I attended before me and had to put up with so much more stuff, um, than I did. Um, and, uh, you know, like the trans woman who set the precedence with the NWT government to have trans health care, um, covered by NWT health. Um, you know, just the, the, the violence that our community has faced not just because of colonialism, but like just that lateral violence of, you know, cis straight indigenous people um, not accepting, you know, two spirit kids and stuff. But I'm really excited about that to, to kind of, I'm returning home today to Catladeche and I'm excited to kind of reconnect with, with my elders um, in this community and just kind of share with them that hope that there are still people um, in our country that are, are having these conversations and putting in the work and that, um, you know, in the NWT, we're, we're not alone in this kind of struggle to find an identity and to connect with other people and continue to build community <laughs> and build connections nationwide. Um, it's, it's exciting stuff uh, and it, it's it's nice to hear other people's stories uh, and how you all relate to these kind of same words and stuff and yeah let's see Trill. Crush. Uh, Blue said something amazing today. I wish I had my notebook. Um, but Blue Waters, incredible elder, um, and like analyst, theorist, general teller of what to do in life. Um, you know, they say that the PH, their PhD is of the land. Yes, that's okay. it. Yes. Um, uh, Blue was talking today during the, the gathering um, and just saying, I'm, a, I'm really, I'm really bad at Miss. I, I'm very good at misquoting people. Um, so they were saying something about how you know you're going to take the next, next steps. Like you know that your body is going to physically be able to take the next step. You know that whatever it is, like mentally, spiritually, emotionally, like you're going to be able to do it and to trust that 
the ancestors are there with you as you do it and that you've done it so many times before and they were like so why complain why get frustrated why get angry like if you know you're, you're capable of it um and I think that that's a perspective that I'm trying to take on joy like lately and just be like okay so what like it's a horrible or like like colonialism is horrible mm -hmm. like it is a messed up system and I am a frail body throwing myself against like concrete and steel um and to just be like yeah that's it that's my experience like you know the other day I was praying and I got stressed out and I was like why would you life is so short creator life is so short why are you making me stressed out while I'm living this short little life and then I was just like well you know everything else is so infinite like and how lucky am I to think that like whether I stub my toe or um someone confuses me for a white girl like that I just am like well it sucks and it's gonna burn for as long as it's gonna burn and then I'm gonna be fine um so I think that's how I've been trying to take joy is just be like wah, wah. um and to just enjoy the moments that are there and to just be grateful for like counting the days that are worth living for and really trying to really trying to see that in my life and to appreciate that in my life um yeah, thanks to all the speakers for everything you shared today. It's been awesome to be in a space with y'all. Chris. Um, I was gonna say something about connection, uh, but honestly, today was a bit of a rough day. I had to do another training for three hours with some people and it was a little bit whack, but uh, so my brain is just like, we're, we're done now. But uh, this was really nice because like sometimes what brings me joy is connecting, is connecting with my folks, is, is just connecting, uh, connecting ideas. Like I'm a weirdo, I love, I just like connecting. Uh, and so I think that's it, just connect, find each other. That's like so important. Um, and also laugh, try to laugh. Laughter is like very good medicine. Um, just try to connect and be kind. Try to be kind. But I think that's that'll bring a little bit more joy. Like fuck the sorry, everybody else is being careful about their language. Um <laughs> like all the boxes and all the things. Like just let's just try to connect and be kind. It's it on it still sounds like some like you pray love white lady stuff, but sadly, it also like makes sense. Um yeah. And thank you so much for having me. This is like a really dope space. Thanks so much. And thanks for thanks for <laughs> Jordy. Um Tesqua. Sorry. Uh why okay, no, never mind. <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh like um Chris said something that I just wanna like or drop one more like um teaching that was that was gifted to me. Um in December, like when uh, in December, I was the um, oh my gosh, like, my brain too is like off. I was uh, the the uh, coordinator for Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week, um, in which took place in Ottawa, and um, uh, that too was like such an amazing experience um, because I was in a room with like a whole bunch of like knowledge keepers, and a lot of them are queer. Uh, but like as um, if you know the history of of Can that was like started by two spirit people. Um, but anyways, I, I sat down with an elder from, and I'm so sorry, but I forgot their name. First name James. Um, out out east west, sorry, in Vancouver. And um, and that it, of course this was in the context of um, HIV and AIDS, but I'm going to apply it to this. Um, of uh, this uh, this elder told me, like it in life we get so focused on these boxes. Like we talked about those demographic boxes of age, of sex, of gender. Like uh, you know HIV positive or negative. Like all of these things, these these words that we put on ourselves. Um, and that's all they are, is they're just words. Um, but if we focus on, on who we are outside of these, or inside of these bodies, sorry, our, our spirit, who we are, who our spirit is, that, that spirit that is going to go back to uh, creator. 
Like if you just focus on that part of your being, that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. Um, and and like that, it it sounds so like easy to say or whatever, but like, holy cow, was that ever powerful? That was so powerful for me to hear. Um, and I really appreciated that. And I don't know, I just felt the need to share that. Um, and that, that leads me to my actual answer of happiness, um, which I've already said today, but it's kinship. Um, being in um, like, kinship is really one of those teachings that, that guide me in life. And it's the one teaching that I hold closest to my heart. Um, when I, there, that we need more love and more acceptance into this world. Um, and we need less gatekeeping and less pretendians and all of that stuff. And, um, and I think for me, the answer to that is like treating each other like kin, uplifting one another, echoing each other's voices. Um, and so I, being in space with my, with my two-spirit kin, with my digiqueer kin and you know whatever other labels you wanna use, whatever words, that's what brings me joy. Um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Pretty sure we're like well over the, the a lot. A lot of it. <laughs> uh, the folks who needed to go took care of themselves. I'm gonna stop feeling whatever way uh, about that, but I do wanna acknowledge that yes, the agreement was one hour. Um, closing, like there's nothing that I can say other than 31 people responded to, to the call patiently, generously came, however their day treated them, personally, professionally, politically, familially, out on the streets. They showed, you folks showed up and talked about not so, um, like who wants to talk about the ways in which trans two-spirit people are erased from Orange Shirt Day? missing and murdered indigenous women, health, um, identity, kinship, families, right? Um, or the future, you folks did. And I, I'm indebted to you folks and those who spoke before you. Um, as Percy, you're muted. If you missed the, the previous speakers, uh, it's in the chat. Um, you, want, you want nighttime reading, refer this to, to this document because it talks about a for us, by us approach right there where I was the lead author. Uh, it was personal not professional or to help me get tenure. I needed to bring attention to Monica Jack, Diane Stewart, Roxanne Louis. Jaleesa Kruger, my baby sister, Sibley. Um, so that's your task, those in attendance who still are here and who still will watch this later. Read that document, much like the red paper policy in 1969 gave direction, much like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People gave direction for settlers and non-Indigenous people and policy people. And, and the TRC calls, the 94 calls to action, which by the way, people need to push back that in two-spirit Indigenous queer trans people were given a half a page out of those thousands of pages of documents of over 126 years. Don't freaking tell me that that wasn't uh, uh, a, 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 an example of heteropainting the past and erasing and disappearing thousands of indigenous children who were two-spirit indigiqueer and trans. There's empirical evidence, anecdotal evidence that straight, that, that settler folks are one in 10 that are gay, queer, trans but it's actually one in five for indigenous communities. So if all the re relatives have been recovered, 20% of them were two-spirit indigenous queer trans. So when you wear your orange shirt, when you say more have been recovered, know that it's bodies that have spoken. It has been ancestors who have been taken from us 
that have also been recovered. So again, webinars, thank you, people called. And I want you to help me close this council fire folks in attendance and give thanks to the generosity of these young folks here and how they nuance what the future looks like and what we've been tasked with to carry forward, folks. So Lim Lum, I raise my hands up to you in the highest form of respect. And for those who've been able to come here to every single eight webinars, um, without you, we are not a people. Without us being part of the ceremony, there is no ceremony. Without us not being in the circle, there is no circle. And without the youth, because I want to be very clear, my indigenous governance system of the four food chiefs and the chap teeth are that youth are the elders. I get that counters. Every single other person's uh, centering of knowledge is situated with older people. Yes, they have a role. But for me, I wanted to bring closure to this time together by highlighting and raising up the brilliant, vibrant folks in my life and who responded to the call without even knowing me to come and share jewels with these folks. And so for that, I say miigwech, nyawin, kukuk, stand me, and my first language, ASL. Thank you. And that's all I got, folks. Inamaya.